Okay, everybody. Um, welcome to the renal anatomy lab. Uh, this is to make up for the lab that we missed as a result of a snow day earlier this week. And what I'd like to do first is to walk you through the first diagram and explain to you the significance of each of the structures. So here we have a drawing basically showing you the uh, human abdominal pelvic region with the urogenital system exposed and just to orient you that's the liver the diaphragm would be up here um, you can see um, the um, iliac crest okay and you can also pick up the aorta and the inferior vena cava so if we wanted to trace what each of these are uh, number one here that is the renal vein okay coming off the abdominal or the inferior vena cava number two is the hilum of the kidney okay the area of the kidney where the renal artery vein nerves and lymphatics enter and where the ureter uh, exits Number three is the inferior vena cava, shown here. Number four is the urinary bladder. Number five is the urethra. Number six is the renal artery, shown here, coming right off the abdominal aorta. Number seven is the kidney, of course. You've got one on each side of the body. Notice that the uh, right kidney is a little bit lower than the left because of the liver that's on top of it. Number eight is the abdominal aorta. And number nine is the ureter, okay, one on each side. Okay. Um, the kidneys are the organs that actually manufacture the urine, and they do so by filtering the blood. What you have to understand about blood is it's got a lot of stuff dissolved in the plasma that's capable of crossing into the kidney. And some of that stuff is good and we want to hold on to it, and some of that stuff is bad. And those include things like nitrogenous wastes, toxins, um, and um, depending on the hydration state of the body, um, how much water uh, we either want to hold on to or want to discard in the urine stream. It also is important in modulating our body's pH. And so one of the other things that the kidney controls is the excretion of protons. So what happens when the blood comes to the kidney to be filtered is that small substances are easily uh, capable of crossing the first portion of the filtration unit of the kidney, of which there's about a million in each. These are the nephrons. Okay, it's the glomerulus where the filtration takes place. And so what happens in the glomerulus of the nephron is that both good and bad solutes enter what's eventually going to be the urine, which at this point is, is termed filtrate. And then what the kidney does is to rescue the solutes that the body wants to hold on to, the fuel, a lot of the water, and the electrolytes, and to eliminate the waste products in the urine stream. And so what you're looking at here is just the gross anatomy of the kidney. Now, um, if we look down here at number one, okay, this is the ureter. The ureter is what connects the kidney to the bladder. All right? Number two is the medulla. The medulla is this deep area here. I'm tracing it. And the reason that the medulla is important is because it's dominated by renal pyramids and a salt gradient, which is the mechanism whereby we control the water content of the urine and, as a result, control the fluid volume of the body. Number three is the cortex. Okay? The cortex represents an area of the kidney that's populated primarily by Bowman's capsules and glomeruli, as well as proximal and distal convoluted tubules. As a result, it tends to have a granular appearance in a dissected kidney. Number four is the renal capsule. It's basically connective tissue 
that holds the rest of the renal tissue in place. Number five, shown here, is the minor calyx. Minor calyx is Latin for little cup, and this is the initial point where uh, the urine is collected. Okay, um, it heads down the collecting ducts, empties into the minor calyx, which then empties into number six, the major calyx, which empties into number seven, which is the renal pelvis. And this leads um, eventually into the ureter and then down to the bladder. Number eight, this region here is the renal column. The renal column are the areas between the pyramids. These are the pyramids I'm indicating here. Okay, And they contain, um, most importantly, the interlobar arteries and veins. All right, number nine is the renal pyramid itself. Okay, that's a renal pyramid, that's a renal pyramid, that's a renal pyramid. And the reason that they appear um, sort of striped when you look at them in a drawing or when you dissect an actual kidney is because of the parallel arrangement of loops of Henle's collecting ducts and vasa recta. And we'll see that in more detail in the next diagram. So let's look at the next diagram. Here you can see a close-up of a lobe of the kidney. The lobe includes the pyramid and the overlying cortex. And what you're looking at in number one is the distal convoluted tubule. Now you might ask, well, wait a minute, why is it called distal convoluted tubule? Well, the reason for that is that if we were to take the nephron, now I'm going to trace the nephron for you, okay? This is the Bowman's capsule, this is the glomerulus, this is the proximal convoluted tubule here, this is the descending limb of the loop of Henle, this is the ascending limb of the loop of Henle, and this is the distal convoluted tubule leading into this, which is the collecting duct. Okay, That's the filtration apparatus of the kidney. There's about a million of these in each kidney. And the reason that the, this part of the, of the uh, nephron is called the distal convoluted tubule is because if we were to actually stretch the loop of Henle out, this wrinkly part of the tubule would be furthest away from the Bowman's capsule. By the same token, this region here is the proximal convoluted tubule, and it's so named because it is near the Bowman's capsule. So to that point, number two is pointing to the glomerulus. Okay, That's the cluster of capillaries um, where the filtration of blood plasma takes place. Um, blood is brought into the glomerulus by the afferent arteriole, and it exits the glomerulus by the efferent arteriole. Okay, just remember E for exit, E for efferent. Okay. Number three is the glomerular capsule. The glomerular capsule. Number four is the proximal convoluted tubule, shown here. Number five is pointing to the peritubular capillaries. Now the peritubular capillaries um, are named as such because they surround the renal tubules. Now what are the renal tubules? The proximal and distal convoluted tubules and the loops of Henle. As such, um, they are going to be found throughout both the cortex and the medulla. Okay, Peritubular capillaries all through here and also all down here as well. Okay, um, number six indicating here is the nephron loop, also known as the loop of Henle. It has both a descending and an ascending limb. Number seven down here, deep in the medulla are the vasa recta. Now, why are the vasa recta big deal? Because they exchange water and solutes with the juxtamedullary nephrons, which are these filtering units that have these very long loops of Henle that establish the salt gradient deep down into the medulla. In this drawing, it's a little bit confusing because the way it should be depicted is that these vasa recta surround these loops. They're just showing you these separately so that you can have a clear look at each of these different structures. Okay, So you could almost look at this side of the drawing as the superficial side and this side of the drawing as the deep side if you'd like. Okay, number eight is the collecting duct. This is the collecting duct running all the way down emptying out into the renal papilla which jumps into the minor calyx which leads to the major calyx which leads to the renal pelvis. 
which leads ultimately to the ureter, which leads to the bladder, which leads to the urethra, which leads to the urinal. And that's the whole trip. Number nine is the efferent arteriole. Okay? Now why is it called the efferent arteriole? It's called the efferent arteriole because it leads out of the glomerulus. Okay? So this is an afferent arteriole, this is an efferent arteriole, and over here this is an efferent arteriole. Okay? You can tell the efferent arteriole is because they exit the Bowman's capsule. Okay? These are Bowman's capsules. Whereas the afferent arteriole come off of the interlobular arteries, which are also called the cortical radiate arteries. So these are all afferent arterioles here and here. So as such, 10 is also pointing to an afferent arteriole. All right. Now 11 is the renal papilla. This is the very tip of the renal pyramid, which empties directly into the minor calyx. Okay, so hopefully you've got all that. Okay, next we've got a series of questions. Number one, why do the pyramids appear striped? And the answer to that is because of the parallel arrangement of the loops of Henle, the collecting ducts, and the vasa recta. Um, otherwise, the, the tissue would appear granular. And you'll see that when you get a chance to open your sheep kidneys. Next question. Why do the renal papillae have tiny holes in their surface? These are the openings of the collecting ducts through which the urine passes as it enters the minor calyx. Next. Why does the cortex appear granular? And that's due to the presence of renal corpuscles. Okay, The Bowman's capsules, the glomeruli, the afferent and efferent arterioles, and also, to some extent, the proximal and distal convoluted tubules. Next question, what structures are found in the renal columns? Those are the interlobar arteries running between the pyramids. And then we get to a very interesting exercise here where what they want you to do is to pretend to be one of two things, either a, um, a red blood cell or a molecule of urea. All right, and we want to trace the alternate paths for each of these um, different molecules. So what I've got for you here is a drawing of a nephron, a collecting duct, and an afferent and efferent arterial, the peritubular capillaries, and the interlobular veins, which ultimately drain into the renal vein. And then I've kind of um, abbreviated the rest of the structures leading away from the collecting duct, but I just want you to watch the path that the um, each of these molecules takes. So let's watch the red blood cell here um, take its path through, and what I've done is I've numbered these structures um, to indicate um, which landmark each of these are going to pass on their trip through um, the filtration apparatus of the kidney. So watch the red blood cell here. Going into the glomerulus, efferent arterial peritubular capillaries, right? And then into the interlobular veins and into the eventually renal veins, okay? So notice that when you were watching that um, red blood cell, that it did not pass into any part of the renal tubule, and that's because it's too large. Okay, Essentially, the filtration that takes place at the glomerulus is based on nothing other than molecular weight. So if you're above a certain molecular weight, you're going to stay in the bloodstream. In fact, it's abnormal to have blood in the urine. That's a condition called hematuria, and that indicates either an infection or some kind of injury in some part of the urinary tract. Okay, It could be in the tubules, it could be in the ureters, it could be in the urethra. Um, it also uh, occasionally happens um, under strenuous exercise where we actually damage the filtration slits in this apparatus and blood leaks in. But um, if you want to sort of landmark where the red blood cell passes, okay, we can go back. Now watch it again, okay, and this is the exercise that's activity three, the matching watch what the red blood cell passes first and passes last, okay? So first past A, then past B, okay? Then past D, and then E, okay? And of course we started um, here in the uh, 
the efferent arterial. Okay, this is the efferent arterial leading out the body. All right. So, um, just so that you understand the path that we took, okay, it should be A, the afferent arterial first, B, the glomerulus, C, the efferent arterial, then followed by D, the peritubular capillaries, and then E, ultimately, to the renal vein, okay? So, just remember what you're looking at and how you're looking at it. Okay, so efferent arterial to peritubular capillary to renal vein. All right, now the next thing I want you to do is watch a molecule of urea as it goes through the same set of structures and watch the green numbers as we move. Okay, so basically numbered 1 through 12, all right, we're passing first the afferent arterial, then the glomerulus, then into Bowman's because we're small enough now to pass through the filtration membrane to the PCT down the loop of Henley, okay? Um, and then um, we head back up into the distal convoluted tubule to the collecting duct to the renal calyx, the renal pelvis, the ureter, the urinary bladder, and the urethra, okay? I'll run it for you again so you can see it. Okay? So that should be sufficient for you to fill out that particular exercise. Okay, next block of questions. Glucose is an example of a useful molecule that filters out of the blood but must be reclaimed by selective reabsorption. If glucose is in the proximal convoluted tubule, where will it go next during reabsorption? It'll go into the peritubular capillaries if we're talking about cortical nephrons, which are mostly in the renal cortex, or it'll go into the vasa recta if we're talking about juxtamedullary nephrons. Next question. Another substance that has to be reabsorbed to a large extent is water. The hormone ADH causes an increase in water reabsorption. What gland releases it? That's the posterior pituitary. And finally, during the fight-or-flight response, sympathetic nerves cause the constriction of the afferent arterial. Would this result in more or less urine output by the kidney? And what would the benefit be? And the answer is we would have less urine output by the kidney to increase blood pressure and send more oxygen and fuel to skeletal muscle. Okay. Now, uh, I want you to do the crossword puzzle on your own, and uh, I will collect these next Monday. All right. I'll see everybody in class. Thanks.